6 a.m. in Kampong Chang province, on the outskirts of the Cambodian capital, Phnom Penh. More than 20,000 workers from nearby garment factories gather to await the arrival of Cambodian Prime Minister Hun Sen. It's no wonder they look so happy. Everyone here has been given the day off work and will be paid five US dollars for attending this rally. During three decades of rule, Hun Sen has cemented his grip on power using a combination of intimidation, fear and violence. The country has descended into dictatorship. We've seen a kind of return to the communist era where, you know, in the 80s, um, every time you moved, every time you did something, you needed permission. Uh, people were following you. You had to report back. Well, we're seeing that return. Well, for all practical purposes, he is a, is a dictator. I mean, he's very, very authoritarian. I think everybody has seen this coming. I don't think there are too many illusions left about Hun Sen's willingness to do whatever it takes, however violently, however uh, disreputably, to stay in office. He's a hardcore uh, authoritarian uh, with a communist background, someone who has, uh, over the period of three decades, assembled um, you know, a, a team of commanders and the police and army who are uh, very loyal to him and prepared to do whatever it takes in terms of violating human rights to keep him in power. Hun Sen was a commander in the Khmer Rouge whose murderous reign killed an estimated two million Cambodians. After a long civil war, Australia took a leading role in the early 90s to negotiate a peace deal and hold Cambodia's first democratic elections. Former Foreign Minister Gareth Evans was one of the architects of the agreement. We got involved essentially because we could. Uh, we, we came up with the idea which won a lot of support, won a lot of traction in the region among the major players. We were stretching our wings in the, uh, the post-cold era and demonstrating what kind of a useful country Australia could be. Cambodia, <clears throat> moving from, from civil war to peace, you know, really, you know, has to thank Australia for some of that because Australia's lead on the Paris Peace Accords and the UNTAC was, was very significant. The UN-sponsored vote in 1993 was overseen by Australian commander John Sanderson. All these Cambodians appeared dressed in their best clothes and they lined up for miles to vote. And it was the most euphoric experience I think I've ever had in my life. You know, it was just, there they were, all were, really excited about it, and they voted. Hun Sen's 
Hun Sen's Cambodian People's Party, the CPP, lost the historic election. But he refused to accept the result, forcing negotiations that saw him appointed as a joint prime minister. In retrospect, of course, that doesn't seem a terribly smart thing to do because that was the very first crack in the, the democratic edifice. And I think looking back, we can say that we were tremendously successful in bringing peace to Cambodia, but we weren't at all successful in bringing democracy and human rights. In Cambodia today, there's an atmosphere of deep fear. The risks are so great, there are few people willing to speak out against the regime. We found one man willing to risk arrest and talk to us. Student Kung Raya has already spent 18 months in jail for daring to write a Facebook post calling for political change in Cambodia. Kung Rai's family have asked him to stop being so outspoken. He recently got married and his wife is pregnant, but he is refusing to let up his criticism of the Hun Sen regime. Before the election, Hun Sen launched an unprecedented crackdown to ensure he would win. The only way Hun Sen can win the next election is to totally, totally eliminate the opposition. Totally. That was at the point that I think the CPP decided, OK, enough is enough. Uh, we're going to have to crack down on this. Otherwise, uh, we might face a, a loss of power in 2018. In early September last year, the leader of Cambodia's main opposition party was arrested at his home in a late night commando style raid. Kim Sukar's wife says they were asleep when their house was surrounded. Kim Sakar's arrest came four years after he gave this speech at a temple in Melbourne, where he said he was receiving advice from American experts. Hun Sen went on TV, saying this was evidence he was a foreign spy, working with America to overthrow the Cambodian government. Kem Sakar has spent the last 11 months locked up in a maximum security prison on the Vietnamese border, and his party has been banned. And for this, he is essentially uh, held in solitary confinement in, these, in this prison, uh, far away from everyone, waiting for uh, a trial that may or may not happen. After the opposition leader's arrest, his deputy fled overseas. 
Musa Kua was tipped off that she would be the next to be jailed. Two phone calls made telling me, you better go. You are next. We can't disclose her location for fears over her safety. We are used to living uh, this life of not knowing who's going to come up at us, who's, go who's behind us. But we shut it off. Otherwise, we can't continue our path toward what we want, which is democracy through free and fair elections. After the opposition was crushed, independent media was next. Within a few weeks, we saw the closure of more than 32 broadcasts of Radio Free Asia and several of Voice of Democracy and Voice of America. And shortly after, under the pretext of taxes, uh, the closure of Cambodia Daily. Two reporters from Radio Free Asia were arrested and jailed, accused of espionage. They remain in prison alongside Australian filmmaker James Ricketson. I'm hoping that I'll find out today which country I'm spying for. I haven't been informed which country I'm spying for yet. Mr Ricketson has now spent more than a year in jail after he was arrested for flying a drone over an opposition rally and charged with being a spy. The courts are completely in the control of the CPP, and because the media is completely in control of the CPP, they can say whatever they want, and it's just spun out there as, as the truth and the law. And so you have uh, Hun Sen saying, well, you know, everything we're doing is according to rule of law, but it's rule of law that he's written the laws and it's his judges who are determining what's legal and what's not. Foreign governments have spent billions of dollars supporting Cambodia in the past two decades. In 2014, Australia committed an extra $40 million of aid to Cambodia as part of a deal to resettle refugees from Australia's offshore detention centres. By making such a deal with the government of Cambodia, the refugee deal, you lost so much of that respect that we give you. The refugee deal has been an expensive failure. Australia has spent almost $8 million on resettling refugees in Cambodia. Seven refugees have been sent here from Nauru. Only three remain. 39-year-old Syrian refugee Abdullah Zalgana is one of them. He hasn't seen his wife and three children for five years. Who made that promise to you, Abdullah? Abdullah is Australian. Last October, with the crackdown on the opposition well underway, Australia strengthened its ties with the Hun Sen regime, signing an MOU to establish new talks between senior officials. In a champagne ceremony in Phnom Penh, Australian Ambassador Angela Corcoran toasted the deal. Our people went to the Australian Ambassador to in Phnom Penh and say, Madam Ambassador, is this what Australia wants? A continued di dictatorship? You must be on the side of democracy. What did she say? She said, Australia is for free and fair elections. Oh, and this is just on the side. 
but you don't drink champagne with the dictators. We found the Australian ambassador, Angela Corcoran, in the southern Cambodian town of Sihanoukville as she waited to meet an official from the Hun Sen regime. Hi, Ambassador Sophie McNeil Corcoran. Hi, Can we ask you a few much. questions Sorry, later? I'm very busy. Thank you. But after you finish, please. Mm -hmm. yes. Is it time for quiet diplomacy to be over when it comes to Cambodia? In the case of Cambodia, it's obvious that such quiet diplomacy as there has been has been utterly unproductive. It's all very nice and well to say that, you know, oh, I'm making private representations. But, you know, if you're, if, the reality is that Cambodia responds to public pressure, not private pressure. Once one of the poorest countries in the world, Cambodia is now awash with money. Here in Sihanoukville, thousands of wealthy Chinese stream into town and spend big in the casinos. It's being pitched as the next Macau, while locals are banned from gambling. This once sleepy coastal town has had dozens of new hotels and casinos open in just the past year, the majority of them built by Chinese investors. Just up the coast from here, a Chinese company has been given a 99-year lease on a massive new development that will take up 20% of Cambodia's coastline. China is now the biggest foreign investor in Cambodia, spending more than a billion dollars here in the last year. Three special economic zones have been built in Sihanoukville, where close to 100 Chinese companies have set up shop. Local officials proudly talk up Cambodia's importance to China's ambitious One Belt, One Road global infrastructure project. ខ្ញុំឃើញថាគម្រោងភ្លោមមួយខេត្តវត្តមួយបច្ចិនណាចំនួនឲ្យដល់បានខេត្តសំណួរនេះគឺមានសក្ដានុពលជាច្រើនធ
when you get that kind of relationship that we have now between Cambodia and China, making it impossible, for example, for ASEAN to reach consensus on resolutions on the South China Sea, then you've got a fairly significant geopolitical shift visibly occurring, and uh, which does have unhappy longer-term implications. Cambodia has the coast. Cambodia has minerals. Cambodia has forest. Cambodia has a dictator. You can buy it all. Despite Cambodia's rapid economic development, millions of people here still live on just a few dollars a day. In the hills overlooking Sihanoukville port, villagers are struggling to hold onto land they've lived on for decades. A wealthy Cambodian businessman wants to develop this land. But uh, these uh, police have a gun and uh, uh, these... Uh, they had guns? Yes, yes, have a gun. In June, security forces came and arrested four of the villagers and they have been in jail since. This man watched as they took away his mother. <laughs> Everyone living here has been told they'll be forced off this land in the coming months. The most dangerous place to be in Cambodia is a, a poor person on a piece of land that a rich person wants. In the capital, villagers from all over Cambodia are protesting after being thrown off their land. When we tried to film one of these demonstrations, we were threatened and quickly forced to stop. To get the permission. to stop. There are other journalists here. There are other journalists. Land grabbing is just an incredible crisis in Cambodia. What you've got is that the poorest, most vulnerable people in that country who are sort of getting some kind of existence out of the land they're on and they're forced off it. So the economic benefits you see are accruing to an elite. Patrick Alley has spent over two decades investigating corruption in Cambodia. In 2016, his NGO, Global Witness, published a groundbreaking report, exposing the incredible wealth Hun Sen and his family have amassed during his time in power. Various sources we've looked at would suggest that that family um, are worth between 500 million and a billion dollars, uh, US dollars. The Hun family essentially control everything, either through familial connections or their cronies. The people of Cambodia have very little money. You know, it's one of the poorest countries in the world. And I know they have to look at their leader and say, you know, what about us? This is Hun Sen's family. Global Witness has documented how his children, their partners and other extended family members own a vast network of companies dominating numerous industries across Cambodia. So there's nothing that happens there that they don't control. And that is corruption in its most egregious form. That's what it's like in Cambodia. It is a mafia state. When the Global Witness report came out, not many in Cambodia dared speak about it. Political activist and commentator Dr Kem Lay was an exception. 
He went on local radio to talk about it the day after it was released. Two days after he did the interview, Kem Lay was having his morning coffee at a petrol station when he was shot dead. The killer was arrested at the scene. He confessed and said he murdered Dr. Lay because the activist owed him money. Kem Lay's widow, Boo Rachana, says the family had not been lent any money. She thinks bigger forces were behind the killing. Are you saying that you feel there is no doubt that this was the regime who wanted your husband dead. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, good, Bob the A. Tens of thousands of Cambodians mourned Kem Lay. Chana and her five young sons were granted asylum in Australia in February. They're now living in Melbourne, where the Cambodian community recently commemorated the second anniversary of her husband's death. <laughs> Just weeks after she arrived, Boo Rachana received a death threat, warning that she and her children would be killed. It was referred to Victoria Police, who launched an investigation. Got my son Noam. Three Australian Cambodian politicians critical of the regime were also named in the death threat letter. Member of Victorian Parliament Hong Lim, Dandenong Mayor Yu Hon Chia, and Councillor Meng Hiang Tak. Well, basically, the letter in summary it says, We're going to kill you and your family in the same way that we killed Dr. Campbell. The Cambodian community in Australia is now being watched when they participate in anti-Hun Sen activities. People are fearful uh, because they've been told uh, once they engage or participate in the sort of critique of the government, they've been told if you go to Cambodia, we're going to do something. Be careful when you go to Cambodia, especially at the airport. You have friends and family and relatives in Cambodia. We know who they are. So the intimidation 
has reached Australia and it's then affecting people back home in Cambodia. That's right, of course, uh, because it's, the intimidation is designed so that whoever in Australia or outside of Cambodia, critic of the government, of the activity, uh, their family or friends in Cambodia is being watched closely. They allow this foreign government to come and intimidate our people, low Australian uh, citizens, and those who come here to study. This is not right. I think the government really had to look at themselves you know, in Canberra properly. If this is not right, it's wrong by Australian, by Australia. We are not like that. In March this year, Hun Sen visited Australia for the ASEAN conference. Down, Hun Sen! Down, Hun Sen! Down, down, down! Cambodian Australians turned up to protest his visit. Before he came, Hun Sen issued a warning to demonstrators. Those threats against the Australian Cambodians were manifestly outrageous and should have generated a quite stern response from the Australian government. I didn't hear of any such response being made, but that was just above and beyond the pale. While Hun Sen was in Australia, regime supporters here held a welcoming party. He used the event to personally threaten Bu Rachana and her children. <laughs> An open death threat made here on Australian soil doesn't surprise Bu Rachana. On his visit to Australia, Hun Sen was accompanied by his eldest son, Hun Manet. It wasn't Hun Manet's first trip here. He's been to Australia at least three times. In 2015, he did an interview with the ABC. You're widely tipped to succeed your father, Hun Sen. Um, is that your expectation? Well, Cambodia is a multi-party democracy. The constitutions indicate that we have election every five years. So the choice, the decisions of who and when to be a leader is up to the people of Cambodia. Not but would you anyone. like to be Prime Minister? Is that an ambition of yours? Would you like to carry on that mantle? The answer is I don't know. <laughs> you must. <laughs> Hun Sen now, many people believe, is in the process of slowly moving to transfer power to his sons, uh, particularly Hun Manet, who's his oldest son. Uh, it, at some point, you know, we're going to have a dynastic transfer of power, uh, you know, so that the Hun family remains at the centre of this web of corruption and all the others continue to benefit. Hun Manet's visits were for a specific purpose, to recruit for the ruling party and boost Hun Sen's support among Australian Cambodians and Cambodian students studying here. In this video filmed at a CPP function, Hun Manet brags about the regime's support in Australia.
Another of Hun Sen's relatives who is a frequent visitor to Australia is his nephew, Hun To. Victoria police questioned him over the death threat letter sent to Bu Rachana and the Cambodian Australian politicians. It seems like he's at home this morning. His black Lamborghini is in the garage of his family home in Melbourne. Hi. My name's Sophie McNeil. I'm from Four Corners. I'm looking for Mr. Hunto. Um, yes. Ooh. Hi. Hi, I'm looking for Mr. Hunto, please. Hunto confirms he was questioned by police over the death threat letter. Mr. Hunto? Yeah. And what did they want to speak to you about? The, the death threats against Bu Ruchana and Hong Lim? Yeah, they, they did mention that. Yeah, and, mm. and what did you tell them? Were you behind that death threat, sir? It's not involved in politics. Why do you think the police wanted to question you then? Because uh, we had uh, had a weapon for police came out. We don't know. Hunto denies any involvement in the death threat. In 2003, he was also the target of an investigation by Australian authorities into heroin trafficking from Cambodia to Australia. But plans to detain and question him were derailed when he was refused a visa. And why do you think they denied you a visa? Uh, you don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I think they denied his visa until 2011. What do you say to allegations that you were involved in heroin smuggling? He's not very concerned about it because he, he knows he, he didn't do anything. Mm. Four Corners has uncovered more than $15 million worth of properties and companies in Australia, owned by members of Hun Sen's extended family and his political allies. There are now calls on the Australian government to restrict the ability of the regime to operate here. I said to Minister Bishop, Australia, please use visa sanctions. Please use active, concrete measures. The Americans have already begun to impose visa restrictions and asset freezes on those close to Hun Sen, with wider measures currently before Congress. The way they're going to be used is you're going to just see those people that get pointed out as the bad players, there's going to be international sanctions. You know, of course, we're going after anything that they may own here, um, travel, uh, exclusions and things like that. Back in Cambodia in the lead up to the election, Hun Sen uses his trip to Australia to claim he is accepted and loved abroad. At one of his campaign rallies, we finally get the chance to try and get some answers. I'm from, I'm from Four Corners in Australia. Okay, yeah. Yes. I wanted to ask you, Prime Minister, well, what will you do if the world doesn't recognise the election results? If they say it was not democratic? What will you do? Uh, we prepare it, but not uh, uh, to complain the election. So this is the idea to uh, visit to my people. Yes, but, but the world says that this 
is not a democracy because the main opposition party cannot compete in these elections. political party, you know. But the, the main opposition party can't compete. No, no, no party. Hun Sen claims Cambodia is preparing to receive more of Australia's refugees. Will you continue the refugee deal with Australia? Yeah, I, uh, I, I told uh, Prime Minister uh, to vote uh, Cambodia prepare for receive more, 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 more refugees, uh, refugees uh -huh. from uh, Australia and uh, uh, to Cambodia. You told I, Prime Minister Turnbull. Yeah. This is uh, if uh, Australia send people in Cambodia. You I, can accept them, you're yeah, ready. Accept, yeah. With Hun Sen poised to start a new five-year term, there is pressure on the Australian government to reassess its relationship with Cambodia and its dictator. Should Australia recognise the election results. Oh, it would be very, very hard to do that in the context of uh, the banning of the major opposition party and everything that's gone before. It's, uh, it's a sham. I don't think it'll be credible, and I don't think the government will. I think they'll have to edge what they say about it uh, because they won't be able to say that it's credible. I think what you'll see is we're going to stand up and just say these are a sham election. This is nowhere near free and open elections. I'd like to see Australia take a stronger stance, come out openly and condemn the Hun Sen regime. They're not doing that. The people of Cambodia look up at the people of Australia, Australians. We envy you. You live in a world of democracy, but your government is disappointing, very disappointing, again and again.